All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so right before we're heading for our coffee, uh, I want to talk a little bit about FP Bindgen, which is a tool for making full stack plugins more easy. Um, well, we're in the context of a WASM conference, obviously, so we're talking WASM plugins. Um, but I really want to emphasize this full stack nature here, because while you can use FP Bindgen fully server side or fully inside the browser, um, it's most effective when you use it in a full stack context. So what does FP Bindgen really do for you? Um, well, you need ca some kind of protocol definition, and then it generates for you a set of bindings that allow you to start writing Rust plugins. And it also generates for you a runtime so that you can run those plugins inside a Rust application. And it also generates a TypeScript runtime so you can uh, run the same plugins within a TypeScript environment, such as a browser. Now, other uh, runtimes may be added in the future as well, but this tool is really Rust-centered, and I think you will find out why shortly. So how does it really do this? How does it generate those bindings? Well, it needs some sort of truth to generate those bindings from, and this is immediately where FP Bindgen rather diverges from most other tools uh, that do bind gen like functionality. Because most of that those tools, they allow you to write a protocol definition using an IDL, or an interface description language. But with FP bind gen, it works slightly differently. Instead, we just use simple Rust macros. So here you see an example of a Rust uh, export macro, which basically tells uh, FP bind gen, this is a function that uh, is exported by the plugin and that can be called by the runtimes. Similarly, there's uh, an inverse macro as well, the import macro, that defines which functions can be imported by the plug plugin from the runtimes. Um, this is mainly all there is to it, but there's one trick under the hood here, and this is why it's so nice that we're using native Rust rather than an IDL, because it just allows you to, to refer to existing Rust types within your project. So if you're building an application, well, obviously you define your own data types. What you need to do is you need to uh, implement this FP Bindgen serializable trait on your custom types, and that's all you need for those types to work within uh, this protocol definition. And well, FP Bindgen will basically take care of the rest. And one interesting thing I would like to highlight there is that um, well, it generates the runtimes for you. It takes care of all the ser serialization issues. Um, and one of the interesting parts of that is that it uses message pack for serialization. Now, message pack is a protocol that is rather like, uh, like JSON, except that it's binary, uh, which makes it a bit more performant, especially if you want to pass binary data back and uh, forth. Um, but another interesting aspect is that it's because it is JSON-like in nature, you can easily extend your structs with, uh, with new fields, and you can do that in a, uh, in a way that does not break backwards compatibility. So if you're trying to build a plugin ecosystem, this is, I think, a very valuable property of this format, because you can keep evolving uh, your, your protocol, and older plugins can stay compatible even if you deploy new runtimes. I already mentioned uh, the serializable trait. This is like the main thing that you need to uh, derive on your custom types uh, if you want your types to work with the FP Bindgen protocol. Um, most of the time, it's as simple as just adding a derive macro to your types. It's really rather simple. And we even have already done that for built-in Rust types, such as vectors, maps, box, some of the common types. So you really should only need to focus on your own custom types. Um, another thing you see here is that um, there's this Rust module annotation. Um, it's optional, but it, it's most of the time you want to use it. The reason for that is that as soon as you make your type serializable, we also generate TypeScript type definitions purely from this Rust definition. Um, but for Rust, it's a little bit uh, more tricky because we already have Rust types. 
And FP Bindgen actually supports generating Rust types as well. But you already have Rust types, so in a lot of cases, why would you? Um, so what you do then is you just specify this Rust module annotation, and basically it tells the Rust runtime, um, OK, if you want to use this type, just import it from this module, and we don't have to do any code gen for you. Um, another thing that is nice about this example is that you can see um, that we support 30 annotations as well. Uh, this is quite relevant, especially for, for the conversion to TypeScript, because we, we serialize this type using message pack, and the, the field names get serialized as well. So in this case, 30 will cause MIME types, which is currently in snake case here, to be converted to camel case. And that's also how it will come out uh, one to one on the TypeScript side. So we need to know the real uh, field names before serialization. All right. And that's mainly all there is to it. Um, we have been using, as Fiberplane, we have been using FP Bindgen in the wild already. Um, we have built our own Fiberplane providers system on top of this. Um, so if you want to get like a feel for a real world, uh, real world, world implementation, just have a look here. It's also open source. And another nice example that I like to highlight is our FiberKit tool, which is actually a bunch of Rust core logic that we reuse between our backend and our front end. So that's also a nice example of things that you can do with this tool. Um, and that's all there is to it. Thank you all for listening. If you are interested, have a look at the project page. Uh, we have Discord too, so if you have questions, feel free to use the conference app or just hop onto our Discord. Um, Thank you all for listening, and enjoy your coffee. <laughs> Any questions I can take now, maybe? Hey, cool talk. <laughs> um, as a fellow Rust macro nerd, uh, <laughs> I was wondering if you could shed a little light on the decision to make use of macro rules versus proc macros in you know, the initial code gen piece, and then on the decorators themselves. Um, yeah, so there are all uh, proc macros indeed. Um, and frankly, that was the only choice because the declarative macros are not, not advanced to do code gen uh, at this level. Gotcha. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. Enjoy your coffee.